When I was younger, I was a member of a club that was something like the Boy Scouts. It was just a local thing though and had no affiliation with a big group like the actual Boy Scouts. We still did a lot of the same kinds of things that they did though. We did camping, learned skills that would help us survive in the wild. It was overall very similar, but just like a local chapter type thing. When I was 12 years old, the group of us were going out on a camping trip. There were 10 of us kids and one 18 year old, who I guess would be comparable to a scoutmaster. We were going to leave on a Friday and come back on Sunday evening. The countryside we were going to go camping in was only about an hour hike away from the road. All in all, it would be a fairly harmless and easy trip for a bunch of kids. Since I'm here telling you this story though, I think you can probably figure out that it didn't quite end up that way. It was a beautiful day early on Friday when we set out for the camping spot. Looking back on it, I felt bad for Evan, the 18-year-old kid in charge of watching all of us. I mean, if it were me, I would hate to be keeping an eye on 10, 12-year-olds. We got to the campsite before noon. It was the same area the group went camping every single year. It was actually set up specifically for us. We were able to get all of our tents put up and a campfire started before very long at all. The first night actually went pretty okay. We did all the normal type of campfire things, told stories and ate a bunch of junk food. We all know what everyone does at the campfire. We went to bed and horsed around the way that boys do and eventually we all fell asleep. It was on the second day that things took a turn for the worse that I will never forget. In the afternoon, we had some spare time from all of our planned activities, so the boys decided that a game of hide and seek would be very fun. We played for a little bit and actually had a few good rounds of fun at first. Whoever it was had to count to 100 too, because we wanted to be able to get away with some really cool hiding places if we could. I don't remember exactly how long we had been playing at this point, but I do remember that a buddy of mine named Bobby was it this time. He was a really slow counter when he was it, so it gave us a chance to get some pretty good hiding places. One of the really neat things though about playing hide and seek in a wooded and hilled area is that even if you can't find a good hiding place at first, you can still move around while the round is going on. I found myself a pretty good spot between a huge rock and a big tree, and I think I got there in plenty of time. I waited for a while until I heard Bobby call out. Ready or not, here I come! Now, I watched from my hiding place which was on the hill, so I could see down at some of the other kids, and I could see everything that was going on. As I watched, I saw Bobby going in the complete opposite direction from where I was. I considered at first creeping down the hill and making a break for the base. Before I could try that out, however, I heard a strange cracking noise right behind me. It was an odd sound, so I looked back to see what it might have been. I couldn't see anything when I first glanced. However, that weird sound had instantly piqued my curiosity. I momentarily lost interest in the game especially when I began to hear other weird noises coming from further up the hill behind me. I left my hiding place and began to walk in that direction. It was really weird, I wasn't even thinking about the game anymore. I just kept hearing these strange sounds and I felt like I needed to figure out what they were. As I went up the hill, it wasn't very high. I eventually got to the top. I almost thought that I would never be able to find out where that noise was coming from. But then I looked down the other side. Maybe about 20 or so feet away from me, I saw a kid named Chuck that was one of the other campers. He was being held to the ground face down, hands behind his back, and mouth covered by this huge scary looking guy. Chuck must have noticed something because he looked over at me. Once he did, that got the attention of the guy holding him down, who looked over at me too. I turned and began running in the other direction. But before you even think about that, I was not abandoning Chuck to the guy holding him down. We were all members of the same group, and the last thing I would ever do is turn my back on one of them. I did the only thing I could think of instead to help my fellow camper. I began screaming as loud as I could the names of all of the other campers playing hide-and-go-seek. I had a pretty loud voice, so I was able to get quite the attention, too. 
I used a lot of expletives in order to get as much attention as possible. Most of the campers, hiders, and the seeker responded pretty quickly. As I got to the bottom of the small hill, I noticed at least half of them had gathered there. I told them some random guy was abducting Chuck and we needed to go save our friend right now. So, as a big group of 12-year-old boys, we went running back up the hill with me leading them in that direction. I guess I thought that maybe the big guy would have come down after me down the hill, but he hadn't. When we got to the top, we were unable to find Chuck or the big guy. They were nowhere to be seen. I felt like I had to explain in better words what I had witnessed. As I stood there explaining, the rest of the boys plus Evan met us on the top of the hill. When I told them what I had seen, all of us spread out to begin searching for Chuck in earnest. We were not able to find him. While most of us kept looking, Evan went and tried to find a phone to call the police. It was still relatively early in the day, so we had a lot of sunlight left. For some reason, though, in the short amount of time that guy had to get away with Chuck, he seemed to just disappear completely. We still kept searching, though, while we were waiting for Evan to get back. When he eventually did, we still hadn't found anything. At that point, police took over the search and had Evan take us back to the camp to pack it up and take us home early. We unfortunately were unable to find Chuck or get any update before our parents came and picked us up that night. The whole thing was extremely tense, and they didn't find Chuck that night either. It seemed they couldn't find any trace of him or his abductor. The following afternoon, however, the police finally found Chuck. He had been tied up in an old shed out in the woods. They were able to get him to safety, but still were not able to find the guy who had kidnapped him to begin with. Fortunately, he hadn't been physically hurt, although I'm sure the mental scarring had to be pretty bad. As far as I'm aware though, the guy was never caught and no one ever found out who he was. There had been a few homeless guys and hermits out in the woods and mine and Chuck's description was not exactly very good. It was scary though living in that area and knowing a guy like that was still loose out there. Probably even scarier for Chuck having gone through what he had. I felt so bad for the guy and he quit the group shortly thereafter. My mom's dog Punky, R.I.P., was a very sweet, loving dog. She was an ESA dog but trained to be a service dog for PTSD before she lost her leg. I had never seen her get aggressive with anyone in the entire 12 years she lived. She never growled or even nipped at anyone. She had no sense of smell, so she loved all animals and people. A real gentle giant among our little terriers at 60 pounds. What I'm getting at here was that her barking at something and being aggressive was so wildly uncharacteristic that I only ever saw it once in my life. I, 11 and female, was home with my siblings, 2 and male and 6 and female respectively. My then stepdad was at work, and my mom ran to the gas station to grab a pack of cigarettes. It was only a mile or two away from us. For reference, we lived in a two-bedroom trailer in the middle of the woods on a dead-end road at the time. You really had to make an effort to get down our road, find our house, navigate down our rickety driveway, and find the door to find our house. I'm sitting at the computer having a grand old time watching YouTube videos, when all of a sudden all of our dogs, about two Boston Terriers and one Chihuahua, perk up immediately, bark a few times, and start investigating down the hall. My siblings were napping in the bedroom at the end of the hall at the time, so I figured they'd just stirred and scared the dogs a little. But then Punky sat up suddenly, stood on the couch and puffed her chest out. Her ears instantly perked up, and her fur started standing on end, her tail straight up. Then she began to bark, and loudly. I mean, it echoed throughout the entire living room, bouncing around. All of a sudden she lunged off the couch and went tearing down the hallway. I was already on edge because I don't think I'd heard her bark ever. She's a Basinji mix, so her bark was more of a baying sound, but it was still big and loud. I stood up and went to look down the hallway, ready to fight off what I was assuming was a shadow monster, based on how all the dogs were acting. But then I heard it. A small knock at the door. 
we didn't get visitors here because of how weird our house was location-wise. My 11-year-old mind had no clue what to do in this situation. I mean, the only people who ever showed up were family, and they wouldn't knock, so I slowly walked toward the door. The knocks drew the attention of the dogs and they came running back down the hallway, all except for Punky. I felt better with our three yappy dogs in the room with me, even if they were only the size of small New York City sewer rats. I opened the door just a bit. Standing on our porch was perhaps the sketchiest man I'd seen in my entire life. I can still picture him perfectly. He was a really thin, taller man with dark hair and a sunken face deep bags under his eyes and half-managed hair, sort of like he'd just given it a quick brush and figured it was good enough. Everything about him seemed just a little bit too thin, a little too shallow perhaps, and his clothes seemed off too. They were all nice, but the fake kind of nice, you know? A clean, newer-looking t-shirt and new jeans, but what looked like a suit jacket on. All of his clothes were real dark too despite the fact that it was summer in Texas and the weather was definitely into the hundreds that day. He had this plain, unlabeled bottle in his hand. It looked like the label had been covered up and taped over. I stared at him in confusion, because I definitely did not know this man. I asked him what he wanted. He smiled at me in a way that was way too exaggerated, this really forced grin, and he spoke in the same manner that retail workers do. Hey there, kiddo. I'm trying to sell this here carpet cleaner. Mind if I come in and show you how good it works? Alarms were already going off in my head because he just seemed so off. Looking back with an adult perspective, the fact that he didn't even ask if my parents were home is already unnerving. He probably already knew they weren't, and that's why he was here in the first place. I should have told him to get off our property, that I had to go and get my mom or something. I didn't say that, though. Instead, I just shook my head and said, No, we don't have a carpet. Well, it sure works on other things. He took a big step toward the door and shook the bottle at me. I started to freak out and think to close the door. But the thing is, our front door didn't even have a lock, so the door was basically useless. I was sure that something very bad was about to happen. I was terrified as I tried to think about what to do in the few seconds I had before it did happen when all of a sudden I heard that sound. Punky had crept up from the hallway, lowered toward the ground with her teeth barred, and started snarling like she was feral. She had this slobber just dripping from her mouth, her ears down like she was ready to pounce. The guy noticed it immediately too. I looked towards Punky as she tried to lunge past me. I barely caught her with my leg as she tried her hardest to duck past me and attack the guy. He started freaking out and ran off the porch without another word, booking it down the driveway, as I let Punky and the rest of our dogs out and they started chasing him. Our dogs chased him a small way down the driveway and stopped about halfway, barking and jumping about madly. Punky, though, stopped on the porch and watched him with her ears perked, just staring into the distance as he disappeared. I swear as I watched him, I saw someone run up and join him when he got to the road. The second he disappeared, Punky's entire body language changed, and she went back to being the sweet dog I knew. No barking, growling, just playing around, mouth and throat covered in slobber still. I realized my siblings were still down and ran to check on them. When I got to the bedroom, I saw they were all sleeping soundly still, but the bedroom window was wide open. The curtains were pushed all the way to one side, and the items on the dresser in front of the window had all been shoved around. Someone had been trying to climb through the window, no doubt in my mind about it. From what I can gather, the window was visible from the couch where Punky was sleeping, so I think someone had been trying to climb through the window before she went after them, scared them off, and then the man at the door went to distract me. It seems they definitely didn't expect a bigger dog like Punky, because most of the time she was with my mom inside while our small dogs were the ones that the public eye saw more often. I don't know what they intended to do, but after my mom got home, she took all of us to my aunt's house. On our way there, we saw the men walking up to someone else's driveway. Men, plural, because we watched a second one split off and wait by the main road. Apparently, the two men were going door to door trying this scheme.
The strangest date that I've ever been on happened when I was in my middle twenties or so. I was working a nine to five job for the first time in my life. I was able to date more, having my evenings and weekends be free now. There was a website at the time, I don't really remember quite what it was, but it may possibly have been Match.com, who really knows, but I had gone on quite a few dates using it. It always seemed to be one way or another, either I really liked the guy but he didn't like me or vice versa. There was an ad that I really liked though, actually I thought that the guy was a bit out of my league. I did think it was sort of cute though how he put his name as the same name as a pair of jeans. It also seemed he was a police officer. That was actually a tiny bit of a turnoff for me. Not the hugest fan. I considered contacting him for a few days, but I noticed he didn't have a picture online and I was really hesitant to go on a date with anyone who would not show themselves. I was a little bit surprised actually when he ended up contacting me first. We talked a lot off of the dating site after a while and he was very talkative. He had a great online personality and was actually very fun to talk to. We got along great and decided to go on a date. We went out on a Friday night. He told me he was going to come and pick me up and we would go out to eat. I actually found myself being pretty excited for it. On Friday night, he showed up. Oh, I hadn't mentioned his name yet, but his real name was Levi. I got into the car with him and really liked him right away. He was amazingly attractive. I still thought he was mostly out of my league. Honestly, I also got the impression that he probably thought that way too. He just really wouldn't talk very much at all. He would occasionally say something or insert something, but it was just damn near impossible to get a conversation going with him. At first, I thought that maybe it was just that he didn't like talking in the car. When we got to the restaurant though, I still kept trying my best to get him to start talking to me also, but all my efforts seemed to be in vain. I could barely get this guy to say even a single word to me. It was a very uncomfortable dinner, needless to say, but I still kept trying. I mean, really, the only thing worse than one of us going through it without talking was both of us going through it without talking. We got through the meal eventually and were on our way back to my apartment building. At this point, there was so much discomfort that I wanted to get back to my apartment by myself as soon as possible. When we arrived, though, Levi pulled the car up into the parking lot rather than the front of the building and parked the car there. I didn't think too much about it, just thought I wanted to get out and go home. Before I could tell him goodbye, though, he asked if I minded if he came up to my apartment to hang out. I was honestly pretty shocked. I had been completely under the impression that he did not like me at all. Just even moments before that, I really wanted to get away from him. I may have been attracted to him, but I had gotten the impression the entire time that he just really did not like me for some reason. I was overcome a bit by my attraction to him, however, and did invite him up to my place. He continued to be quiet while we both sat there on the couch. It didn't take very long though until he eventually made a move on me and we ended up having a fun time fooling around quite a bit. It was actually kind of fun. He was a really passionate guy. When we were done, he even sat there and watched a little TV with me. But after a bit, he decided that it was time for him to go. I walked Levi to the door, he gave me a great kiss and then he left. Honestly, I was feeling so great after that. I went back and sat down on the couch. I watched a bit more of television for an hour or two before reaching over and picking up my laptop computer. At this moment, I realized I'd not checked my email at all since I'd gotten off work earlier in the day, and that had been about seven hours previously. I noticed that I had gotten an email from Levi earlier in the night. I was very confused at first because it looked like he had sent the email while we were still on our date. I figured he must have done it when I was in the bathroom or something at the restaurant. My body went numb when I actually read it. He told me that his car had been stolen earlier in the night. His cell phone was in the glove compartment, so he had been unable to call me and let me know. He apologized for that and said he hoped I was not mad and didn't think he had stood me up for our date. He hoped I'd give him another chance and we could try again the following weekend. I sat there on my couch still numb, not even hearing the television. If that wasn't Levi then who the hell was that? It must have been the guy that had stolen his car or something. Why did that guy come on the date with me instead? How did he even know? Was I in danger with this strange guy who was obviously a car thief at the very least? 
His car was found abandoned on the side of the road later, so he did get it back in the end. I told him everything that happened when we eventually met, and it freaked him out quite a bit too. 